in the hard drive we have the feast of that great Pope who rose from obscurity, St. Pius X, who was canonized in 1954. He died beginning of the period of the First World War, 1904, but he was one who had been very close to his people and therefore when it came to the intuitions that he'd acquired in his early days as a priest, he was able to put them into practice on the level of the Universal Church. The importance of participation he wanted people to not pray at Mars, but pray the Mars itself. And a whole movement was set in motion. It led eventually to people acquiring missiles, that rather than saying the rosary, to be actually following the prayers and the readings. It was also greatly important, he saw, that there should be voter participation and that the people themselves should sing. Hence, he encouraged participation on the level of Mars, the people who could actually sing, which is what we're still doing, and also that they should participate by reception of the Blessed Sacrament itself, more frequently, extending that even to the little people. So, a lot happened in that time. Not forgetting that he was also the pontiff that had the intuition that he had to protect the faith. It was the time when in the middle of Europe there was a huge thrust outside the Catholic Church initially to Protestantism but then there was a danger of infiltration, modernism which is, as he called it, the synthesis of all heresies. And he made it impossible for that to spread through the imposition of the Pian Oath, a remnant of which sort of remains at ordination. I remember having taken it. It was in the form now offered by the Church, which is simpler but nevertheless essential. And this then was what kept the Catholic Church from contamination for a long time. I make a jump to link him with another great pontiff centuries earlier, who was also thought about on this day. It was the day when he was raised to the See of Peter. It is the election of Gregory the Great, and he was initially miles away from any ecclesiastical career. He was engaged in the cursus honorum, the course of honours in the Roman system, and he got to the key point of being made the prefect of Rome, which would explain how he was, when it came to his future in the church, he was the man for the hour in a crumbling Rome. The one person who was solid and could be looked to on every level while the world was crumbling, the world as they knew it. So he initially was touched by a powerful but gentle grace which led him not to the active life in the beginning but to a quiet contemplative life the monastery of Saint Andrea on the Celian Hill. Therefore a quiet benedictine and that is what forms him and what comes out in his eventual writings. He is the very one that gave us all we know about St. Benedict, who had not long died. 
and we have it through the dialogues, the famous dialogues. It's the second book where we have all the stories that we know of the Holy Father, the patriarch of the monks. He loved the monastic life but was wrenched from it when precisely because of his earlier background he was seen to be useful. Ordained a deacon, he was sent to Constantinople, the New Rome as it was called, and it was a very important bridge. These delegates, legates, who were going on behalf of the West to the East were the very ones who were making the West aware of the issues in the East, where theological and philosophical dialogue was sometimes advanced to a degree that it wasn't as yet in the West. It's a complex time. He then was acquiring experience, so all this would explain how he was the natural choice when it came to his election. Now he, remember, was formed as a monk, and what he's coming through in all his preaching is active contemplation. Essentially, what begins in God and then becomes useful unto men. It's not the other way around, and that dynamic is the correct one. It starts in God. He honoured God with all his being, and in that he resembles Pius X in the intuition that he had with regard to the importance of liturgy. We have the expression Gregorian chant. It's that Gregory that's in question. Not that he invented it or composed it, but he codified it. Therefore, the corpus is already pre-existing. And, for instance, one of the mosses that we sing at the Hermitage quite often, it's number 15 in the gradual, is very early, parts of it especially. And therefore, he would have known it. Therefore, what he's doing is putting together and standardising for the churches under his authority, therefore the West, what is already there and keeping it from irregularity. How did he do it? It's through copying, getting copied, and that meant heavy work. It meant copying manually, and we have the whole tradition in the monastic life of scriptoria for that. And we know what that means here in this area, precisely not far from Kells. A great art. So the Book of Kells is written not all that long after he died. He dies in 604. What is also important is the way that he standardised liturgy because he got the Gregorian sacramentary put together and this is what came with the thrust of evangelization to England. One day he was seeing these slaves for sale in the market. They had blue eyes and fair hair. And he asked who these were. And the reply was, Angli, or rather, yes, Angli sunt. They are Angles, they are English. And he said, non Angli, said Angeli. Not Angles, but angels. And then he had the intuition, we must give them Christ. And so, what did he do? He didn't look around for anyone at all, but went to his monastic roots, picked a perfect model of a monk who would be able to act also as a preacher and evangelizer, Augustine, and wanted 40 with him to go together as a group with precisely the books from Rome. Therefore, the faith went with the Roman origin. They arrived at the Isle of Thanet, they were sent in 596 and arrived in 597 and penetrated inland in the area of Kent, eventually got as far as the king because they knew as in later time, for instance the Jesuits, the way to get the people is to go into the top and Providence cooperated with them, often through the ladies who might be close to the top. The queen might be the one to get the king, and so on. And it worked. And so, eventually, penetrating to Canterbury, the beginnings of the cathedral would be there. 
but who is dedicated to St. Peter, indicating the close link between the founding and the origin, and the Benedictine movement to go with it, which would explain also why, in subsequent generations, that was going to be important. Remember that the great king, Saint Edward the Confessor, who was a very holy man, got built that wonderful abbey of Westminster, still standing to this day. And of course was buried there and is still there, and Pope Benedict went to venerate him. Well, he wanted precisely the chant of the centuries around him, and Westminster Abbey was kept by Benedictine monks. And we know now that when they were re-electing the hierarchy in England, the head of the church at the time, the cardinal who was responsible, had a hidden plan to re-link with that tradition and to have Benedictines singing the office in the cathedral that he was building, Westminster Cathedral, the Catholic one. And for that purpose he invited Downside Abbey, one of the biggest, to send a colony. They came and they set up at Ealing, where they still are to this day. But when it was leaked eventually to the secular clergy that this was going to happen, there was an outcry and he couldn't go ahead. The secular clergy wanted that it should be completely in the hands of diocesan priests, but the monks nevertheless remained at Ealing. It's an interesting formula, however. Prayer and praise, gratuitous praise to support the work of God. It's anchored, therefore, in another dimension and gives it great serenity. This, then, is our faith and our heritage. Yesterday, I was at the only Episcopal ordination I've ever assisted at physically. The only other one I've seen was the one of, the one I know actually, Abbot Basil Hume, who was Abbot, because his monastery was responsible for our, for our parish, and he was made bishop in 1975, and we saw it on the television. But this was the only one actually I'd seen physically, and it was very moving. Our new bishop there being ordained and given those ancient signs of his authority and role, the very ones precisely would come from these earliest times, a continuity, but also one felt the continuity on several levels. At a certain point, the question is asked, have you a mandate from the Holy See? And then the mandate is read from Pope Francis in translation, a very solemn, long formula is placed there for all to hear, ancient in tone, solemn in tone but indicating precisely the way that the Church acts. It has to be coming from the successor of Peter, of which the Gospel speaks, feed my lambs. The authority to teach is there, and when he's lying on the ground, during the chanting of the litany, the Gospels are over his head. This, then, is what we have. I just conclude but it was a moment of almost a mystical order when we were praying for the descent of the Holy Spirit. We had, first of all, the singing, actually in English, of the Veni Creator, but we then had the solemn, silent imposition of hands of the primate of the Church in Ireland, Archbishop Eamon Martin, who celebrates very, very well. And then, of all the other bishops present, there was a huge number of bishops present, including, of course, the nuncio. And then we have the form. The matter is the hands, and the form are the words. And the words, when they are completed, make complete the power of the fullness of the priesthood coming from Christ the High Priest in the Last Supper. So, by the end of the prayer, it has happened. And only then is he given the insignia, the signs. But at that point, it's quite long actually, because of the number of bishops involved, 
there's a lot of interiority and silence and intensity in the air. And I had my eyes closed, of course, and at a certain point, something rather similar to what happened when I was actually ordained happened. I could sense the Holy Spirit is around. There's the great power in the air here. The Holy Ghost is really moving. And this is coming from outside this cathedral. It's coming from beyond. It's coming from the heart of the Trinity. It's coming from the upper room. This is the power of the church at work. Something is happening here. Remember when I was ordained, that same thing came over me and I almost felt at the moment of ordination of being singed, signed, made a priest from deacon, then it was as though my soul was caught up into the Blessed Trinity and signed, marked by something objective outside myself, but forevermore. Well here at this point something unexpected happened. It was as though I could see all the centuries of history, that is of church history there, Patrick with the same flame, the same power, the same authority coming from Rome, and also David, St. David, and the element there was quite moving. Patrick and David were both Welsh, it would seem, but this Celtic thing was also a part of it, but this was something rich in grace with a powerful history of sanctity. Both Wales and Ireland had so many saints and I almost, as it were, saw David there, as it were, in the heart of the Blessed Trinity and something, as it were, in his heart. If only that same power could come back also, again. Because he was the great preacher. He had the Holy Spirit and him, we know from the iconography, that something would flutter on his shoulder when preaching and the ground rose when he preached one time. But as though heaven were crying, the power is in the air, but it's being blocked. The church is unchanged, but the Lord is not able to act freely. He wants it cleansed. He is unchanged. And the same power is there potentially, but we are upsetting the balance by being too human in the midst of the divine.